Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Last week after I interviewed Zia Salam and asked the critical question, what does it feel like to be a Muslim in Narendra Modi's India? My guest called me and suggested I should do a second interview, this time asking, what does it feel like to be a secular Hindu in Narendra Modi's India? I thought it was a fantastic idea and I immediately accepted. And it therefore gives me great pleasure to welcome today one of India's most highly regarded former Home Secretaries, Gopal Pillay. Mr. Pillay, as I started with Zia Salam, let me start with a simple, straightforward question. What does it feel like to be a secular Hindu in Narendra Modi's India? I think I will um, recall what uh, Mr. Salam said, uh, that it is not Narendra Modi's India, it is contemporary India, because even if you look at it, uh, less than 40% of the people voted for the BJP. Therefore, there are 60% of Hindus who didn't, or rest of the communities, who didn't vote for uh, Mr. Narendra Modi. It feels, at the moment, I would put it as we are little uncomfortable, we're little frustrated, and really in a position where we don't know what we should really do. That, in one sense, sums up what a secular Hindu feels uh, today. I'll talk to you in greater detail about contemporary India. I'll use your phrase, not Modi's India, although I think the two are synonymous. But before I do that, let me ask you this. How much different was it to be a secular Hindu when Manmohan Singh and Atul Bihari Vajpayee were prime ministers? Well, it was much more, I think, uh, the ability to express one's opinions uh, fearlessly without any consequences, uh, the tolerance of dissent. I think the keynote or the defining feature of, uh, you want to put it as this government, is the absence of any toleration or uh, tolerance for any dissent. And uh, this is very uh, bad for a democracy. And this matters to secular Hindus as much as this does to Muslims, for example. Yes, it does. Because uh, you're not able to then speak out. You're not able to point out the mistakes that are being made. Uh, and therefore, because those mistakes are not pointed out, uh, things get from bad to worse. Before I talk to you about what secular Hindus should do, to stand up for and to defend their principles and in particular their secularism. Let me ask you how secular Hindus respond to things that are happening in India today. For example, when BJP leaders call Muslims Babar ki aulad or Aurangzeb ki aulad, when they taunt them with phrases like Abba Jan, when they repeatedly tell them to go to Pakistan, is this a matter of concern for secular Hindus? Yes, it is a matter of great concern because uh, what they are saying is uh, something totally, in one sense, unacceptable. Uh, I think uh, if one looks at, and I am purely looking at uh, from the DNA concept, uh, the human DNA, uh, there is no such thing as a Muslim DNA and a Hindu DNA. And if you look at uh, the DNA of particular individuals, you will find that uh, their origins are 
uh, from quite different parts of the world. Uh, my, I myself, uh, I got my DNA tested and I have 66% of my DNA is from the Central Asian Republics. And I come from Kerala. So, uh, uh, to call anybody, uh, you know, uh, Aurangzeb ka this thing or Babar ka is really, uh, I think, uh, hitting below the belt and uh, not acceptable in a democratic India. Now, Muslims are frequently accused of love jihad, an alleged conspiracy to convert a Hindu girl into a Muslim through the disguise of marriage. Would secular Hindus say there's a lot of truth in this, or would they say this is a fake and false allegation? See, I, I, we, do, we really don't have what I would call as statistics on how many Muslim men are marrying Hindu women and how many uh, Hindus are marrying uh, Hindu uh, uh, men are marrying Muslim women. We don't have that statistic. So, uh, at least till the time I was Home Secretary, there was no such report by any agency. I'm talking about agency means the IB or others, that there is something like a love jihad or a conspiracy by some group for Muslim men to marry Hindu women. So this is something which is a post-2014 uh, phenomenon, if I may in one sense put it. So if you don't have, and I personally don't think that it is of such a great number that uh, we should really be concerned about it. So what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is there may be one or two or a few instances of it, although we have no proof as such, because the government, I think, has admitted that in Parliament as well. But it's not a matter that should be spoken of in such highfalutin terms, made such a key concern. Yes, definitely, because jihad is a concept, uh, you know, as a popular concept, uh, which is, shall I say, uh, in one sense, uh, uh, critical, demeaning, uh, it's criminal in one sense act, but this is, m most of the cases which at least I have seen uh, are those where a Muslim man and a Hindu woman have fallen in love and we have many cases of that. I have even uh, batchmates in the IAS who are Muslim have married a uh, uh, Hindu and uh, Hindu has married a Muslim woman. So I don't think there is any concept of a love jihad uh, issue there. It's a pure uh, human interaction between two people who meet and fall in love. In this connection then, let me ask, how do you view what happened recently in Parola and Uttarakhand, where after an allegation of love jihad, the letter X was painted on Muslim shops, on Muslim houses, and many fled out of fear. And then when Eid happened, they weren't even allowed to hold private gatherings in their own personal homes to offer namaz. How would a secular Hindu respond to that? I think this is totally illegal act. And this is where I think the administration, the state police, the state uh, chief secretary, the state home secretary have to, what I call, uh, you know, uh, use the whip and say that this sort of thing is not tolerated, cannot be. And that, this is not being done. And this is uh, also what I uh, put it as the failure or the near total collapse of many institutions in India uphold democratic constitutional principles. But you're saying a very important thing. The administration, the chief secretary, the district collectors failed to do their duty. Yes, definitely. Because here it is not anybody, it doesn't require any instructions from anybody else. The law of the land is very clear. If somebody does this, and this is likely to incite communal issues and so on, he can take action on his own. He doesn't need instructions from anybody. He can go ahead and do it. In which case, let me ask you this, did they fail to do their duty because they came under pressure from politicians or did they fail to do their duty because in their own hearts they gave way to prejudice, prejudice against Muslims, that they've fallen under the influence of this prevailing mood which is anti-Islamic? That is very difficult to say, but I think uh, a civil servant, uh, by virtue of the fact that he's been trained uh, both in the academy and uh, in the field, uh, is trained to f uphold the constitution. You take an oath. In fact, every civil servant takes an oath uh, on assuming of his IAS, the volunteer services. And therefore, you are sworn to uphold the constitution. So uh, there's no question of you're getting, if you have an in, in, inward pre prejudice, you have to suppress that 
and the constitution and the law is supreme. So they've betrayed their oath? Yes, definitely. I think in, in many cases, I find that the lack of action, the lack of what I would call it a proactive uh, action to have the law implemented, to preserve law and order, uh, is not taking place today. And that is one of the causes of concern. It therefore follows that these civil servants who failed, who let down their oath, need to be taken action against. They need to be punished. Yes, definitely. But that hasn't happened? That, yes, that has also not happened and that is why I call it the failure of the institutions. Right from the top to the bottom? Right from the top to the bottom, yes. Let me go one step further. How do you view the various acts in several states which make it increasingly difficult, if not close to impossible, for an Indian citizen to change his or her religion? Ironically, these are called freedom of religion acts. But would a secular Hindu say these are justified because they are protection against forced conversion? Or would he say this is unwarranted because I have a right to change my religion when I want and I do not have to give two months notice to any district collector? Yeah, I think, see, the right to free change your religion is your constitutional right. Whether it is forced conversion because of any other extraneous pressures being put on you is a separate matter. But the right to change your religion is there. But I think the prevailing atmosphere is such today. And I think it, this is something which has not come about uh, in the last few years. It's been something which has been percolating, as I put it, as undercurrents over the last 30, 40, 50 years uh, has now come up to the top where uh, people have become uh, shall I say, ultra-sensitive to such issues. In other words, action should have been taken years or decades earlier to change this percolating atmosphere. Now it may be too difficult to do. Yes, I think uh, what uh, we did not realize, and I must say, uh, we in the sense that responsibility is also ours, that uh, when we were in service and we, we saw this change taking place, uh, and I think we didn't realize the implications of this change, both among the Hindus and among the Muslims also. I just give, the Hindu um, has the predominance of, you know, the start first with the, I'm proud of being a Hindu, to learning more about the scriptures, learning more about, which is, which is all perfectly okay. But this othering is, the, is, is in one sense the issue. And for the Muslims, in one sense, a little bit of exclusiveness, partly as a result of the influence of what I call as Wahhabism from the Middle East. I just give you one example. When I was district collector in Quailon and I addressed a staff conference, I could not make out the religion of uh, my staff because all of them wore either mundus or pants, the men, and saris or half saris women, everybody, including the Muslim women. Today, if you were to have the whole same staff meeting in this thing, totally, all Muslim women would be in hijab or burqa. It's a change which has taken place in the last two, three decades. Can the clock be wound back or is it impossible? It's possible. I think the Muslim community also needs to uh, do a little bit of introspection. Uh, why uh, this need to uh, you know, this exclusiveness to protect their identity and is, this whole thing has come in the sense of my identity and therefore to show my identity, I'm therefore uh, uh, wearing this burqa and uh, hijab. Would you say the same thing to the Hindu community? That this yes. se call my Hindu who has gone too far? It's gone too far, yes, definitely. Because it's a question of you can be proud, but you don't have to make it impose your will on the other. And that is one of the tolerance. You know, when I remember the famous uh, uh, Churchill uh, incident where he says, I have a walking stick. I can toll it as much as I want, but when it stops at the end tip of your nose, I can't hit you with that and say, that's my, I'm using my freedom of uh, movement. So it's exactly that way. You see this today in uh, the Kamarias as they're traveling. Uh, you see all the meat shops to be closed. I mean, it has nothing to do. They can walk on the road, they can do their this thing, 
Why do they have to meat shops to be closed? Zia Salam spoke about precisely that. He said in Navratri, meat shops are closed. And it's not the shop owners that suffer, but the daily wage, wage workers who lose out money and don't have money. That is the sort of imposition of will which you're saying to Hindus, it's not necessary. Not necessary at all. You can, have, you can be proud of being a Hindu, you can express your uh, Hinduness without having to close down a, a Muslim shop. But this requires political leadership or community leadership. It requires voices to be able to speak to both communities and say, hang on, think what you're doing, you're going too far. That voice, that political leadership, that community leadership is missing. Yes, totally missing. It's uh, totally missing and therefore you've let out uh, uh, a demon. The demon and uh, you're riding a tiger on which you just can't caught, get, you're not able to get off its back. Let me point out something else about Muslims. As you know, they're cattle traders, they're exporters of meat, they're eaters of beef. Chances are that if they do any of these three things, they'll probably end up being lynched. And the worst part of it is that there are states like Haryana and I believe Madhya Pradesh, where there is state government involvement, maybe even protection for cow vigilantes. And many poor Muslims in those states live in permanent fear. How would a secular Hindu view this? I think we, these are issues which I mentioned earlier as a failure of the administration to act according to the constitution and the law. The constitution and the law is very clear. You don't allow vigilantism to function. If you, if you see that happening, then it's a duty of the person implementing the law and order, whether it's the SHO, whether it's the sub-collector, whether it's the collector, to take action against these officers, people. Now, if you don't do this, that's your failure. But what happens when you get instructions from the chief minister or the home minister? I won't name them, that will be invidious. Telling district collectors, you'll work with the cow vigilante. You will be informed by the cow vigilante when he suspects there's a cattle thief and you will attack those people. What does the district collector or the superintendent of police do when he gets these orders? He used to actually tell the chief minister that the order is illegal. The law says one thing, and if you want, please give it to me in writing. And I can bet on that not a single chief minister will give such orders in writing. So, the superintendent of police or the district collector requires a spine to be able to stand up? Yes. And he also requires integrity to do it? Yes, I think uh, you have to stand up and I think if you stand up, you will find that many politicians will, like, at the most what happens, you get transferred, fine, take a transfer. In other words, be prepared for a certain cost to your career because your oath when you became a civil servant is what you have to stand by. You have to stand by that, there's no doubt about it. I think we've stood by it in many cases, I, any number of incidents where I know where pressure has come from uh, the chief minister and so on. And we said, no, sorry, we can't do it. And uh, finally, we were all, shall I say, proved right. In, in hindsight, uh, we were backed up uh, and uh, supported later. But Mr. Pillay, there's a corollary to what you're saying. A good, honest civil servant has to be prepared to suffer some damage to his career because he wants to live up to the oath of his office. Unfortunately, that is the sort of period we're living in. You have to be prepared to suffer damage to be able to do the right thing. Yes, I think you, you will find that as you do more and more, uh, and I, uh, you stand firm, your uh, general reputation precedes you as you get. And then you will find that uh, politicians will not come to ask you for these things because they know that this officer will not do it. Do it once and you'll begin to protect yourself with your own reputation. And we've seen that. I've had ministers who've told me when I've left the ministries and so on, who said, uh, th thank you very much for all the times that you said no to me, because that made sure that you and I both stayed out of jail. So uh, that is the end result at which you, you are satisfied, you, you are happy that you did this, what you did, because even finally the politician also respects that. Let's come to another aspect of Muslim representation in India, and this time I'm talking about public life. Let's start with politics. Both in 2014 and 2019, the BJP does not have a single Muslim Lok Sabha MP. At the moment, they don't even have a single Rajya Sabha Muslim MP. 
in Karnataka, in UP, and for 25 years in Gujarat, they haven't fielded a single Muslim candidate. How would a secular Hindu view this? It's unfortunate. It's a choice that they have made, that political party. They have made that choice. Uh, and I think people have to then, when you vote for political parties, you have to then make up your mind. And this is where I think uh, <coughs> uh, most opposition parties are failing to realize the extent of the propaganda and uh, if you want to put it in other words, the poison that has run since uh, crept into Hindu society, uh, which allows, which sort of says that this is the new normal. Uh, and uh, if you go, and I, I know I've spent last few years uh, going through many of the uh, social media websites, and there are hundreds of them, uh, which are propagating these ideas very subtly, very, uh, very scientifically, very, very, uh, uh, with a subtle touch, and including the think tanks which have proliferated in number, but all financed by, again, uh, these groups, which have now, it's become now in one sense, many people are, this is the new normal because they see this is a research article. It's a simple thing like, you know, uh, the Muslims are, population is going to overtake the Hindus and they will, uh, uh, take over India, it will become an Islamic state. Now, we've seen statistically what that shows that, you know, it doesn't show any, any all projected things, even over the next 50 years, 100 years, doesn't show anywhere. It's absolutely impossible for 15% to overtake 80%. Absolutely impossible. So, uh, we don't see that. But there is a very insidious uh, propaganda which has there in the, on the social media websites of, that you have to, therefore Hindus have to How produce. How do we fight that propaganda? It has to be fought, again, by, you can't fight it um, directly, in the sense that, again, because of uh, the powerful influence of social media and the WhatsApp groups, groups which have formed there, most are getting sounding box. You are in a group with 20 people who are, you are resonating on the same issue. Therefore, you are not getting a, a new uh, idea which is coming in. And if you get the new idea comes in, the 20 of you oppose. And the person who comes in with the new idea has to be. I uh, will just give you an example of uh, something which happened to uh, a colleague of mine, uh, actually a journalist colleague, whose son, um, in first year of engineering in, uh, in college, shall I say, converted as a result of the social media into, inverted commas, a Hindutva uh, proponent. And talks about, you know, how the Muslims are going to take over India and so on and so forth. Impossible directly to tell him with facts, etc. He says all these facts are wrong. And therefore, you have to then slowly, as I put it, very subtly, you have to show him a fact, some government statistic, and say, this is the government statistics of the Narendra Modi government, which is telling this, and uh, you swear by Mr. Narendra Modi, therefore, this has some, this, you have to start believing it, and at least sow the first seeds of doubt where he would then But you are talking it. of a very long, arduous, cumbersome process that could take decades. It is going to take place. I think, I think the, uh, the process has uh, uh, been so uh, extensive. Uh, this is not something which is going to, it's not like the emergency and the lifting of the emergency and you're back to normal. This poison has seeped deep into us. And it is going to take uh, maybe a generation, maybe two generations to... Uh, but you know, Mr. Pillay, it's not just that this is something that's happening in contemporary India. I called it Modi's India, you called it contemporary India. Akar Patel's book, Our Rashtra, Hindu Rashtra, suggests that in fact it's a process that's been happening for decades. Muslims, he points out, are 15% of the population. His research shows there are only 4.9% of state and central government employees, 4.6% of the paramilitary services, 3.2% of the IAS, IFS and IPS, and perhaps as low as 1% of the army. That's not something that happened in the last nine years. That's been happening from the 1950s, steadily onwards. This is a problem that we have to wake up to and say, it's been in our system 
and it's getting worse. Yes, it is true. I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is something that's been happening for decades now. And uh, we are seeing the, shall I say, the culmination of it's come to, you know, a boiling point. We didn't realize it. It's like the typical uh, mouse in the boiling water. But uh, what we're agreeing on, I think, is that our system, not just individuals with their prejudice, but our system has been pushing Muslims to the periphery steadily, which is why their representation is a fraction of their actual proportion of the population. Yes, it's true. It varies from state to state. I think if you see Kerala, I, from which I come, I think the proportion of Muslims in, is slightly much better there. Uh, the population percentage is higher and they have political power, they have economic power, the Christians there also have political economic power. So they have sort of managed in one sense to make sure that the certain element of proportionality is maintained. It's very different in UP and Bihar. Yes, it is. I mean, one of the things that I found particularly shocking when I read Akar Patel's book is that Muslims are 15% of the population. Proportionately, they should have something like 74 seats in the Lok Sabha. At the moment, they have 27. There's not a single state out of India's 28 where we have a Muslim chief minister. In 15 states, we don't have a Muslim minister at all. In 10, we have just one each, usually for minority affairs. Surely, they must say to themselves, I'm treated as if I don't belong to this country. Yes, this is what happened. I mean, a simple state like even Manipur, where there are only one person Muslims, uh, it had a chief minister, you know, a Muslim chief minister. Absolutely. And then uh, Kerala has had, you know, chief ministers, Muslim chief ministers, C.H. Mohammed Khoya and so on. So, uh, it's something which uh, we haven't paid enough attention to. And we need to pay a lot more attention to it now. Much more. I think it's, uh, it's a wake, the wake-up call has come, the wake-up call literally has gone. I think we are, even the opposition political parties, uh, media, uh, they haven't really woken up to the fact. So this is a moment of potential crisis. If we don't wake up and act, things will get a lot worse, unimaginably worse. Yes. I think we, we don't realize that uh, there are uh, about 200 million Muslims in India. And you are talking of... Uh, 120, 130 militants in Kashmir and to tackle that issue, you are having 200,000, 300,000 army and parliamentary troops. Close to six or 700,000. Just imagine if it happens in central India and so on and so forth, just a few hundred or a few thousands out of the 200 million, country will collapse. That is the potential danger we have to avert. We have to. There's no doubt about it. It's going to happen because we've seen it every other state, country in the world, whether it's Sri Lanka, Pakistan, even Israel, which is one ad greatly admired state. But what, how they are treating the Palestinians, Israelis, if you want to call it that way, and how they're treating the Palestinians is creating a huge problem for them. What you're saying is that the treatment of Muslims, the othering of Muslims, the rhetoric we use, the way we accuse them of love jihad, perhaps unwarrantedly, the way we beat them up because they're cattle traders and accuse them of killing cows when they may not have done it, that is playing with fire. Yes, I think the impact of this is, will be felt in the next, not immediately, but maybe in the next 10 years, 15 years. The next generation is really going to, if you do not reverse this, uh, I think we are in for very serious trouble. We're in for civil war, possibly. Possibly. Not just civil war, I think you will have civil disturbance, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and you will, that will have its own impact on the economy because people who want, you say, if everybody wants to come and invest in India, if there is civil unrest and they we won't see that, touch us. Nobody, they won't touch us. They won't want to come. They, everybody wants security. So Let me come at this point, Mr. Pile, to the Prime Minister, not just because he's the most important person in our country, but he's probably the most influential person in our country. Tens, if not hundreds of millions model themselves on him. They're influenced by him. They emulate him. In December 2021, Adharam Sansad in Hardwar issued a public call for the genocide of Muslims, for ethnic cleansing of Muslims. A lot of Indians were horrified. The Prime Minister was completely silent. Would secular Hindus expect their Prime Minister to criticize and condemn such calls for genocide? And secondly, would they be dismayed and disillusioned when he doesn't do it? See, I think secular Hindus would be dismayed and uh, disappointed that he has not condemned it. Because uh, 
there are a number of uh, uh, aspects on which uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has to be admired uh, in terms of uh, the stability that he has brought in one sense to the government, which has helped our international, international relations and the foreign policy. A number of visionary aspects which he has taken in terms of getting India as is. He also realizes that India has to grow much faster than it did than in the past. You are in that takeoff stage, if you want to put it that way. Therefore, infrastructure, uh, renewable energy, uh, you know, Swachh Bharat mission, which I thought for a Prime Minister of India to announce Swachh Bharat mission from Red Fort was, I think, uh, a brilliant. No other Prime Minister did it before him. So, uh, I am disappointed that he has not realized the implications of what he is doing. Uh, he's brought pride to a lot of Indians, including secular uh, Hindus, I might say. So, in many areas which we didn't even know about, uh, parts of our own history, and I think uh, that is itself important, uh, uh, what I call learning process, which is taking place uh, in the whole uh, uh, system. Uh, and but then tell me, why do you think secular Hindus would be disappointed and disillusioned? Those were the words you used when the Prime Minister fails to criticize calls for genocide. Because if you, if you, if you, if you do this, then you are, you are really lay, laying open what I call as uh, for a, a crisis to develop in the future, which will come back at you and make you, you unsafe. He has cabinet ministers who have publicly stood up and said, Goli maro salon ko. They weren't removed, they were promoted. Yes, I know. And I think uh, that is uh, something which, uh, it's, a, it's what I call as the message which people down below see. They, say, they see that if you make these type of statements and if you get promoted, then that is the incentive which people are getting to make more of these statements and think that, this, got, this has got the Prime Minister's uh, backing. Okay. He has chief ministers who call Muslims Abbajar. And the Prime Minister calls that particular chief minister the best in the country. He has party MPs, MLAs, even ministers who are constantly telling Muslims in public, go to Pakistan. On all those, the Prime Minister silent. Is that what we, a secular Hindu, would expect from his Prime Minister? See, the Prime Minister is his oath by the Constitution and the laws of India. I mean, when he, 2014, he actually uh, knelt before parliament and uh, before he entered it. So is he letting down that oath of office? He swore an oath. Is he letting it down by his silence? Yes, definitely. His silence encourages those who are committing these uh, illegal acts uh, to do more of them. And his silence is pushing India further down that road we talked about where in 10 years' time we could be faced with civil war or civil disobedience or whatever. Yes, if He's I letting it happen. It, it could happen. I mean, whether it's 10, 15 years, it's, it's, uh, the timing is depending on how uh, the whole, uh, you know, the economy, both Indian economy and world economy and all develop. But no country which has sectarian strife or sectarian strife which comes has prospered anywhere in the world. And if that happens, I'm not saying when, if that happens, we look back and say, Narendra Modi and his government didn't stop it. They allowed it to happen and they appeared to encourage it. Yes, I think uh, they will be held mainly responsible for this by future generations. Narendra Modi and his government will be held responsible by future generations for endangering India. If they do not reverse the steps onto which they are going together and bring about a much more harmonious uh, relations between communities, Muslims, Christ Christians, etc. It, it, it Let be me a raise something else the Prime Minister talks about. He spoke about it most recently to the US Congress. He talks about what he calls 1200 years of subjugation. And clearly, he doesn't consider the Delhi Sultanate or the Deccani Sultanates or the Mughals as Indian. He considers them as outsiders, as foreigners. How would a secular Hindu view this period of our history? See, bulk of the people of secular Hindu are 
this is totally beyond the concept because it, this is purely a gangetic plain dominance of India. If you look at Kerala, if you look at uh, Tamil Nadu, if you look at uh, Karnataka, Andhra and so on where the Deccani Sultanate and all those empires, both Hindu empires like the Vijayanagara Empire as well as the uh, Kutub Shahi, and, Kutub Shahi and all that. Uh, it's, a, it's a totally different world. I mean, today you don't even realize that there was an Ethiopian uh, slave who actually became a ruler in the Deccan and ruled for some years and there was no, uh, and he fought against Aurangzeb also. I mean, so this concept of 1200 years of subjugation is alien to South India? Yes, it's alien, totally alien to, I think it's alien to secular Hindus. Uh, so secular Hindus in South India would say, what on earth are you talking about? Exactly. Should secular Hindus in North India start saying the same thing? What are you talking about? These are our people, they are our brothers and sisters. Yeah, they mean, if you, if you look at the, uh, the way history, and if you read history and study history, uh, then you will find, unless you do that, you are only looking at uh, the great Indian Empire, which, you know, if you look at it, you've got Mauryan Empire, you've got the Ashoka, and so on and so forth. The bits and pieces of during a thousand year period, wherever the rest of, rest of the history is all totally different. So you're suggesting, if I've understood correctly, that by harping on about 1200 years of subjugation, the Prime Minister is in danger of misleading people who are ignorant of history. F he's encouraging them to form the wrong opinion, which is factually incorrect. Yes, I think you have to, see, people have to read history. I mean, you have to, it's not something which you will get. See, uh, it, it's, it's in one sense, you know, where is for the secular Hindu in one sense or the Hindus, uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are so important for us purely. You know, it's on the subconscious mind. I mean, I never read the Ram Ma Ramayana or the Mahabharata. It was told to me every day by my mother. It was, you know, it was oral transmission, if you want to put it that way. But that history, it's a, it's a great story. But I, I don't believe that, you know, that uh, the, you know, if when the head was chopped off and the elephant head was put, that it was plastic surgery or it was any, uh, it's something, it's something which the prime minister don't believe. believes it. He said yeah. so. You know, he said so at a gathering of scientists in a hospital in Bombay in October 2014. I can see it. I think he, I, I, I tend to think that he was trying to pull a fast one on them. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> Let me raise something else with you. In the last eight, nine years, several cities and roads have had their names changed. Muslim names have given way to non-Muslim names or Hindu names. And to many Muslims, this is a deliberate attempt to obliterate the Muslim heritage of India. How would a secular Hindu view this? Would he say this is understandable and acceptable because we don't want to remember this past and therefore this is the revenge we take on history? Or would secular Hindus say, this is deeply mistaken, A, it's denying the reality of our history, more importantly, it's denying the interconnected, interwoven nature of our culture? You know, I, I, I put it more in the tense of, these are what I call as uh, changing dynamics of governments and politics. Changes will come and changes will go. Part of these names have, you know, earlier they had certain names, they had been changed, maybe some by the British, some by this thing, etc. Some are coming back. So it, it's a, it will, it's a on and off it. Next government comes, some of these will again get reconverted this back again. doesn't upset secular Hindus? It, I don't think so. It, because these are immaterial. Change of a name this way or that way, I don't think they really make any great uh, difference. Uh, more substance part of it is, you know, you economic boycott, the, the polarization of communities. These are the more critical issues, communal harmony, then changing names and BJP so members, sometimes they're MLAs, sometimes they're MPs, often threaten boycott of Muslim traders, Muslim shops, and the Prime Minister is silent. How would a secular Hindu view that? His own party men are saying boycott Muslim shops. Yeah, this Ill that's, a, that's an illegal act. It, it's against the law. So you have to take anybody who talks of economic boycott, who, as you said, if somebody marks a shop, who op brings in up parties to say that 
And this, this is something which is happening very slowly. Uh, what do you say of a Prime Minister who acquiesces when others in his party are breaking the law and suggesting something that's illegal and unconstitutional? And he's silent. He can stop them with just one word, but he doesn't. What do you think of such a Prime Minister as a secular Hindu? See, I th many of these are acts which the action should be taken at the grassroots level. It is by the district administration, by the state administration, which action has to be taken. I don't expect the Prime Minister to be responsive to all issues. I agree that in, when, you, when a major incident takes place, and I think like major incident like in Manipur and so on takes place, yes, the Prime Minister should definitely… Or when a dharma son says ask for genocide. Genocide. He should, he should come out and say, this is something totally unacceptable. And when he doesn't come out and say it, what do you think? I mentioned that then the, it gives an encouragement to, to those that it has the backing of the Prime Minister. This is why future generations will say, Modi and his government at a time of potential crisis fail to avert it. Yes, I think if, if, they, if they don't do this and the process is not reversed over the next few years, I think any government in its uh, power and wisdom may think that we can manage the situation and we have seen it across the world. History is a witness to it. If you, if you don't remember history, you're forced to, you know… Uh, One last question on this before I change subjects completely. How close to danger point are we? I think we are still uh, 10 years or more away. 10 years or more. In the lifespan of a country, 10 years is very little. Very little. Yes. I've deliberately taken you as a secular Hindu through a whole series of developments that are happening in today's India. You will probably notice that these are mirror images to the questions I asked Zia Islam in the same way. Let me now ask you, how should a secular Hindu stand up and defend his secularism, stand up and defend the principles he believes in and ensure that they are practiced in his country? See, one, I think more and more, um, uh, we want to put it secular Hindus, I should say Indian citizens, um, secular Hindus or secular Indian citizens should speak out on what they feel is wrong. Uh, they should say that this particular action is illegal, is not correct and therefore whoever has done that should face the consequences of being prosecuted by an FIR being filed, by court cases, etc. I think one is very important for pe more people to speak out against what is happening. Because if you don't speak out, uh, it's what I call the sounding box. The, everybody thinks everything is hunky-dory. So you're saying there's an onus on every single individual who is a secular Hindu to speak out and to make clear this is not acceptable. Yes, I think where uh, issues of, as I mentioned, you know, genocide, economic boycott, uh, you want to prevent uh, lynchings and so on and so forth. I think every single um, Hindu, Muslim, Christian has to come out and say, this is not acceptable. Do they need to go one step further and perhaps do what's prevalent in America, not in the name of my religion? Do we need to make that clear? This cannot be justified in the name of my religion. Yeah, different. I think we have our own cultural differences. I don't think not in the name of my religion may not. You have to do it in your own way to say this is not, a, this, this is not acceptable. But there is a duty on every individual who is a secular Hindu to speak out. Yes, not just secular Hindu. I think every, sec, every person, every Indian citizen to speak out. But this is a bit like the district collector and superintendent of police that we spoke about. Speaking out in this atmosphere of intolerance of dissent means that you're doing something at the risk of your own safety or your own security. You have to take that risk. You have to take that risk. I think uh, an IAS officer or IPS officer is uh, well protected under the constitution. You, you are not doing any Ill, anything illegal. You are only saying, I will not do an illegal act. But what about or, the ordinary individual who is not an IS officer? When he speaks out, does he run a risk of annoying the government and some sort of pushback from the government? See, 
yes, if it's influential enough where the government feels that they might take action against you, but that's a risk that you have to take as a citizen. If you don't take that risk as a citizen, you, end, you tend to lose that citizenship. So this is the duty of integrity that secular Hindus have. Speak out when something wrong is happening. Yep, definitely. One more question. Unfortunately, the influence of Mr. Modi is so all-pervasive that political parties who otherwise should be speaking out, I'm talking of opposition political parties, are hesitant, if not scared, to take up what are called Muslim issues. They don't speak out when Dharm Sansad call for genocide. They don't even visit the relatives of someone who is a victim of cattle lynching. Should secular Hindus say to them, we don't admire this pusillanimity, this is not what we expect? Yes, I think we should be able to say that this is something which is again not acceptable to us. If you go, uh, we will come with you. Uh, we should be prepared to do that. And they should not uh, feel that by going, that taking that extra mile to bring communal harmony, uh, they are going to lose the votes of uh, secular Hindus. So they need that assurance from secular Hindus as well. We won't hold it against you. We won't punish you if you go and show sympathy or help in need to a Muslim. Yes. And, and I, put it, I put it across communities, whether it's a Muslim, whether it's a Christian, uh, whether it's a, even a Hindu, if you want to put it that way. They, they should be prepared to go uh, and uh, express their sympathy, express their uh, feeling, their opinion that this is not acceptable. My last question, Mr. Pillay, I'm going back to what I said in my introduction. When you saw that interview last week, with uh, Zia Salam, you rang me up and you said, you spoke to him about what it's like to be a Muslim in Narendra Modi's India. Do an interview about what it's like to be a secular Hindu in Narendra Modi's India. Can I end by asking, what motivated you to pick up the phone and give me that message? It was a fantastic message, but why did you feel you wanted to do it? See, I felt that one... The Muslims in India must know that there are Hindus who also support them uh, and who are not in favor of all these illegal act acts uh, like lynchings and genocide and you know, economic boycott and so on and so forth. There are a very large number of Hindus who are not in favor of this. Uh, we, are, we all want to live in peace and harmony. In one sense, I apologize, the Hindus are the most tolerant. We accept uh, so much. And we want to say that all of us finally are, you know, roti kapda or makan is a basic. These are the fundamental things which we are really looking forward. And the rest of it is what we call as diversionary issues, which others, we should not fall into that trap. The important thing you said, if I can repeat it, Muslims must know there are a very large number of Hindus who support them, who do not accept lynchings, who do not accept boycotts, who do not accept calls for genocide. That was the message you wanted to convey. Yes. Thank you very much for choosing my program to do so. Thank you for a fantastic idea. Thank you for this interview. Thank you. Thank you for accepting. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.